I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of being alone. I am fearful of what might happen if. Hello and welcome to the Be Well Now podcast. I'm Nick, the curious patient. And this podcast is about wellness. It is about living in the now, in the present moment. And I'm with Dr. Ron Dumar with Community Health and Wellness in Hebrew City, Utah, to talk today about fear. Mm -hmm. I'm a little afraid of where this is going to go. Yeah, well, we might all be afraid of where this is going to go. Fear is something we all deal with, and we all come in, uh, we all we all come in contact with at some point in our life. And so, while those things that we often fear, we don't have a full explanation for, or we don't even fully understand, uh, we all at least understand fear. Like we all know this. When we mention fear, we all know what it is. And I think that that's a fascinating thing for us to recognize is more often than not, when I hear people talking about fear, they're saying, what are you afraid of? There's, you're making it up in your mind or you're creating something, right? So it's like this illusion almost that we've created. And yet we all know with certainty that feeling, right? 100%. Of fear. Is the background music going to... I just remembered that... Sorry. Oh, is there... Do you hear background music? Or am I just in my head? Am I afraid? I don't know. I don't... I heard it earlier and I thought... We don't have any in the office here. Oh. And I've unplugged the phone, so we should be good. Oh, man. So should we start over or should we... I... I killed the vibe, Dr. D. It's all right. Do you want to start over or do you want to just pick up an edit point? Well, we can also just... Okay. Edit that. So, um, yeah. so maybe I'll do my intro and then just say, so, and I guess my question is, what is fear? So I think to address this question, we have to look at things from a biological perspective. And then we also have to start to unravel things or peel it back on an emotional and a psychological perspective as well. So there's a real biology to fear. There's um, mechanisms, chemicals that are released in the body when we have this feeling, right? The question that we have to be asking or should be asking on the biological end is, is are those things released in the body so that we have that physiological effect and feeling or, or is it something that we have first emotionally that elicits that release? And I don't know that we have the real answer to that. We're doing a lot of digging research-wise as to where this emotion of fear comes from and why we experience it and, um, and, and essentially how we experience it, Okay. But we do know that when people are in a state of fear or anxiety or panic, that there are certain chemicals that are more uh, readily floating through the bloodstream than otherwise. So these are things even like adrenaline or norepinephrine or um, things that would be the antithesis to these would be uh, something like serotonin, which would be a better mood regulator. We'd see a lot more serotonin and potentially even acetylcholine present in, in someone's body if they had less fear, right? Or if they were less prone at this point to fear in fearful situations. So there is a biological root or there is a physiological response that we have happen People will feel their heart, heart rating, heart racing. Sorry, wow, I mixed up all of those letters. People will feel their heart racing. They'll feel sweaty palms sometimes. Uh, they'll even feel uh, their chest, like a heaviness or a weight on their chest. Difficulty sometimes getting a full deep breath because of fear. Uh, and it feels like the world is closing in, that we're unable to fully... Uh, mentally work through tasks that otherwise would have been easy for us to accomplish. It's a crippling thing that even when your mind says, I have no reason to be afraid right now, mm -hmm. your body is not listening. 
your body is taking over. And I wonder what sort of cycle is happening there. So I suppose what is happening in the moment and how do we de- how do we work with that is a pretty interesting question. Ab- absolutely. And it's, again, like you're saying, what is, what is happening there? And it's like a disconnect. It's a, a checking out almost or a separation. I describe it to patients a lot as a, um, a separation of the body and the soul. In Eastern medicine, they talk a lot about shun or shen, uh, which is the thinking part of the heart. Uh, they talk a lot about uh, the mind and the body. And we hear that a lot in, in our culture as well of my brain, my brain controls the physiology and my brain controls everything that occurs. And if there's a chemical imbalance in my brain, then I'm going to have a, a disruption in physiology. And that's the way we look at it in Western medicine a lot. So essentially each of those is a description of some sort of separation between the body and the mind or the body and the spirit, the body and the shen as the Eastern medicine might refer to it as. And we have to really get into why is there a disconnection or a separation? And maybe is it important for us to at least acknowledge or be aware that yeah, there is a separation. If I ask you, Nick, if I ask you, would you say that the person you are is ideally resembled in the physical body that you have? Is is that is this these fingers, right? Your elbows, your body, is that you or would you say that There's something that is you actually perhaps directing a lot of what people see. Well, I think if you were to cut off my hand and my arms and my legs, whatever I would still need to like literally function, everything else is gone, right? If I had no extremities and you were to say, Nick, are you your body? Because I'm still here, but none of that is. So I have to imagine, and I don't know if this is the question you asked, that I have a soul or a spirit that is more than my body but we're still in this human life in this body. So it's a tough question for me to answer. Yeah. Yeah. But I think most people, and I think this is what you're going through with your discussion too, is that most people um, at least relate to a piece of them that they would say is not their body, right? Whether that's a thinking piece, whether that's this voice that constantly goes on in the background um, questioning or talking or asking, or if they have this conversation that's happening behind them, a lot of people will have a conversation that goes on frequently in their, in their brain. Right. Uh, but is that their body? Um, is that the physiology that they see in front of them? It, it would, it would seem that it isn't right. It would seem that it isn't because so many of these things and conversations that they have and that they're walking through are separate from a lot of the actions that they're taking in their life. So there it's itself is a separation between something and another thing. And have you ever felt in your life like the, the intent or the things that you want or desire uh, are out of a situation are not exactly those things that are coming of that situation. So when we, when we look at who we are, how we are expressing ourselves, and if we're filled, let's say we're filled with an emotion that is um, anger, let's say we're filled with anger, but we want to, we're trying to go in and resolve a situation, a problem, right? That could lead to, let's say, war between two factioning groups. And I meet with this person, but I'm filled with anger over them. What's going to be my communication to them? How am I going to be communicating? What, what are my even, let's say, nonverbal cues going to be? We should check out the podcast on anger for this. Yeah, we should. Or, or our listeners should do that. They they should. And that's a really that's a really good place for them to check. So 
the point with that is that there's often separation. We often have separation of mind and body. Okay. Is that like an out of body experience or is that when you feel so filled with anger that you don't even recognize yourself? You almost feel like you're looking down at this incarnation that's doing things that surely can't be you because you would never act in that kind of way. Yeah. And then, or after, afterwards, people sometimes after they do things, not even in the moment, sometimes people have those experiences when the moment they're shocked. Oftentimes it's after they're ashamed right or they're or they're looking at it like was that was that really me how did i how did i act that way okay so the important thing is that to recognize there is a physiological thing happening there are chemicals being released there are things occurring in the body and that's going to result in a physiological response and then there's also this uh, mental or even emotional or spiritual aspect of things, which we're doing a lot of research and trying to figure out and understand how that impacts or applies. So what we need to be doing in Eastern medicine, we encourage the connection of those two. That sometimes we can have a, a separation of those two, but what we need is a connection. And when, when our heart and our mind or our shen is connected right, and our soul is connected with our body, then we're going to be functioning in a lot more true to ourselves form. So we're talking about fear. We're talking about a disconnect between body and soul, heart and mind. We talked about anger. Obviously, everything is connected. Yes. But fear. Yeah. Where does it come from? So that is a really good question. I don't have the answer. And I think that's an important place for us to acknowledge, uh, at least to understand first. I don't know where fear comes from. I don't, I don't know that any of us know where fear comes from. But it's, a, but it's a great thing for us to explore. And I think, that, I think that at this point, we need to look at a few of those things that we know do cause fear for people. Like for, with a certainty. I think one thing that we can say causes fear for a number of people is heights, right? So if I'm standing at a, at a cliff and I'm looking down, I can have a significant amount of fear. This weekend, uh, my family and I, we actually went to Lava Hot Springs and they have these platforms. Right? They have diving boards and they have platforms. And I'm looking up at these platforms, and when you're standing there, like, those look tall, but, they, you know, they look doable. Well, when you're observing from out here versus when you're experiencing, it's a very different situation. And so sometimes people say, well, I don't know why we can't just talk this person off the ledge or why, why we can't just tell them, hey, there's nothing to worry about. Well, when you're experiencing it, it's, it's overwhelming almost, right? It can become all-consuming. So I went up this platform. There's three platforms that they have. The first one is about 16 feet. The next one is 27 feet high. And the next one is 33 feet high. In, in the U.S. military, they did a lot of research and studies, and they looked at and they said, okay, what is... What is something that we can use as a measure, as like a threshold to say, okay, if people will jump at this height, then they'll jump at any height. Like if they'll jump at this height, they'll jump at 5,000 feet. So that's what they're trying to determine because, well, they, they want them to be able to jump at 5,000 feet and they don't want them to be up, uh, up on a mission and then have to like basically boot them out of the plane or have them experience an overwhelming uh, anxiety, panic attack, just to try to jump out at 5,000 feet. Well, what they did uh, is they found that uh, soldiers, people in general, if they're willing to jump from 35 feet, that they would be willing to jump from 5,000. Now, that's interesting because, you, to me, we're looking at degrees. Uh, you could look at degrees of fear. And obviously, people would say, well, if... If 30 feet is fearful, well, 
A thousand feet should be a lot more fearful and 1,500 and 5,000. But I think this is an important point because if you'll jump from 35, you'll jump from 5,000. That's what the research shows. That means that there's this whole gap of distance, right? Where essentially the fear is not compounding. Does that make sense? It's Yeah, I want to know what that looks like in regular life. Yeah, well. I'm, I'm trying to take that that range and bring it back to Nick's everyday life, talking to somebody, making a decision, but I'm, I'm back with you. Yeah. I just, I just feel like there has to be a connection and I know you're going to get there. So let's look at, let's look at a uh, fear of snakes. So a lot of people have a fear of snakes uh, and some people don't have a fear of snakes at all. Wh- tell me what's the moment, like think about the moment between a fear of snakes and no fear of snakes. Inexplicable. I have no idea. I, I don't either, right? But it seems to me like thirty five to 5,000. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So something's happening there. Something's happening there. And what they found in research is that it's there's two ways of basically approaching this as far as working on it, saying, okay, how can we overcome this fear? Okay? So one way is desensitization. So how do we desensitize you? Well, we have you go and do 16 feet, a 16 foot jump. So I would go up and I'd jump off the 16 foot platform and I'd, I'd do it again and I'd feel comfortable with it and I'd do it a number of times. And then I'd go up to the 27 and, you know, or maybe I'd go to the 20, right? And I'd slowly move my way up progressively, progressively. And eventually I get to that 35 point and then at that point it doesn't matter anymore i can go all the way up that's a fascinating thing but that's desensitization it's incremental exposures okay and literally what they've found with anxiety and depression in research is that those people who have anxiety who have these fears about uh, integrating in life in certain ways it is really good for them like they have to get these incremental exposures, but if they get too heavy of an exposure or too, if they're exposed too quickly, right, or too repeatedly, it can become overwhelming and and uh, essentially revert okay, to a incredibly fearful state again. So it's a it's a delicate balance getting there. So the other. The, um, the other thing is to go about and just completely submerse yourself. This is a way of doing it as well, and that's to basically um, pour yourself into it so that you just get over it as quickly as possible. So that's like, okay, no, I'm just going to build up my confidence. I'm just going to go for that 35, right? I'm going to go straight up there, and I'm, and I'm going to do it. And just immerse yourself with all of it as quickly as you can and uh, overcome it that way. All I know is that we live in a culture where fear can lead to decision-making, whether it's what channel to watch on TV, what to buy, how to plan your life. And to me, that seems like there is some utility in fear, but it also seems like a, a pretty destructive force. I was meditating and having some interesting visions sometimes, and I was on this... Uh, this cliff had gone through a tunnel in a mountain and um, I don't think I even wanted to jump. I think I was a little fearful and I'm sort of having this out of body vision where I fall off the cliff and I'm watching this sort of body uh, fly through the air. And then instead of this horror of watching a, a body get smashed and bloodied, I just sort of see the silhouette of this body in sort of a dark landscape literally integrate into the earth. And I was the earth, and I was the ground, and then I was sinking into it, but everything was okay. And afterwards, I sort of thought to myself, what am I so afraid of if I am everything and we are all one? Now, I might be getting out there for some folks, but it was like, what do I have to be afraid of if where I'm going to fall is? It is. We all are, and we're all this. And so I was like, where would I fall? Mm -hmm. Where would I fall? What would I be afraid of if... What I'm going to fall on is who I am and we are as one. And again, that might be a little out there. So uh, like for a day, I'm feeling on cloud nine. I'm like, 
sorry for mixing metaphors. I'm like, I got nothing to be afraid of. Where am I going to fall? Everything's great. Yeah. And here I am today, deathly afraid of, of the next step in my professional career or what's going to happen next week. So it's one thing to even touch into a feeling of, ah, but then mm-hmm. to continue living in this world, fear, fears back. Right. And it, and it consistently confronts you, right? It's all of these interrelationships that we have and, and these tasks that we need to perform in order to have some semblance of life. And uh, I think to some degree people would say it's hard. People would say it's hard. And the, the work that is required to maintain even just life is difficult. And there's a fear around that too. Like why do we why do we have to do this? Why do we why do we need to maintain this consistently, right? And then all of those interactions that we have to engage in in life, relationships with family and friends, uh, those that have been to family reunions know frequently that that as much as the kids seem to really enjoy it, adults seem to you know, have some fears about getting together. And uh, there always uh, seems to be a great disruption in uh, those situations. And so, well, is there reason to fear? You know what? There may be. There may be some reason to fear. But the question is, what do we do with that? Right? So, okay, here we found a situation, a job, uh, a cliff, um, a snake, what do we do with that? Is there reason to fear? Well, are snakes dangerous? Potentially, yeah. Are, are cliffs dangerous? Yes, they are. And can, can relationships be dangerous? Sure. They, they all can be scary, fearful, and dangerous. The question we ask is, is the suspicion of danger sufficient enough to prevent engagement in the activity. And so that should be one of the first questions you need to answer. One more time. Is the is the fear or or is the is the danger sufficient enough that we choose not to engage in the activity? What if the danger being such a small percentage but such a grossly outsized, potentially horrific, catastrophic event, even though it's such a small percentage, it could happen? What do you do with that? Yeah. What do you do with that? I'm asking you. I I don't know (laughs) the answer to that. but But these are the things that we deal with. If we've recently gone through a worldwide pandemic... What drove a lot of our decisions was fear. And we look at the, the level of potential harms. That's exa- exactly what you were discussing. What's the level of harm versus the level of significant harm? Well, the level of infection was told that it could have been quite high. But what was the level of harm from infection, well, it depended on certain groups, uh, it depended on certain demographics, right? And so based on demographics, those things became, those, those risks became different. But as a whole, we decided to, uh, and I heard this phrase a lot, out of an abundance of caution. So is, it, is an abundance of caution Oh, is that the wise way to go through engaging in life? Or was it detrimental to the kids and potentially even to the adults during this time? Well, there is actually a a number of different research papers that have been published on lockdowns and masks and a variety of different things right now. And this is not meant to be a public, uh, a, a political podcast or statement but I encourage you to go look at that information. Look at, look at 
what the impact was of lockdowns, uh, of, of completely alienating people from each other out of an abundance of caution or out of, out of fear. Fear I, that we might have uh, an uprisal of, of uh, over-infection, right? Rates, higher rates of infection. I think in an ideal world, I would want to lead with an open heart and engage in the world with a sense of what is possible. But an abundance of caution sounds like a really tough way to live. If I were to lead with, I am doing everything out of an abundance of caution. But then there's privilege involved here because certain people in certain countries or situations fear for their safety at all all times for real legitimate reasons. And we can take a lot of that for granted living where we are right now. So it's a dance. Mm -hmm. So there's the pandemic. There's the bigger reality of how certain people must probably fear to survive every single moment of every day. Yeah. Well, that's true. You're talking about like in war zones. Sure. Where you've got bullets flying over your head or we are sitting here talking about be mindful and be in the moment. And certain Mm -hmm. people are in the middle of a war zone or... Um, in the middle of a, of a poverty-laden situation where they don't know where they're going to get their next meal. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, my thinking mind is going to all these possibilities instead of being right here with you as we talk about yeah, and abundance th- of caution versus an open heart. And I think part of our privilege as well doesn't, doesn't allow us to recognize that some of those situations that you pointed to, n- now I haven't, I can't claim that I've been in them, right? That's our, that's privilege, right? I can't claim that I've been in, in those situations directly. But I can, I can say that I've observed and I've read significantly about some of these people's experiences and that their ability to experience joy and um, satisfaction and and life and to understand life is every bit if not more uh, engaging than my first world approach uh, as far as my worries about you know my shoelace or my 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 pants that I just tore so I'm gonna have to go buy some new ones you understand what I'm saying? It's sure. like the, the tasks that they're undertaking on a regular basis as well are actually life preserving. And what is, when we think about things that are meaningful, co- contribution to meaning in life, wouldn't I want tasks that I'm performing to be, to be contributing to preserving life so they're just closer to they are more in tune with meaning because everything they do has it or more of what they do has to do with being alive and surviving and contributing to that in others whereas we're a little bit lost in things i think our heart knows yeah they don't really matter yeah like did you get the recent update because this, this is this there's this Spotify really cool, is, yeah, yeah. yeah you know what I mean it's yeah, like what mean. well what's the what's the value and and even in the production era of that right so not just from my end of that but from the production end of that meaning the the producer of it what's the level of mean is that contributing to my to my existence well it's it is contributing to my convenience and I thank you for it you know and in a first world country they may even get really really upset at you if you don't continue to provide such convenience i i think that people understand i think the the example there right it's you you provide this oh, hand over fist you're providing 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 and every little detail is accounted for and then all of a sudden the, the one providing becomes the problem, right? Because there was a little glitch. And everyone's freaking out. Ah, I can't believe this. That update screwed up my phone. I can't believe You know, it's like, oh my gosh, the world's over. We're done. We just can't function anymore. 
and a simple little thing, and then the next update comes out, and you know, or they give you a little fix, and you're. Good. I mean, all this matters to people's lives, as sad as that is. And all I could think about as you were talking is, does what I'm doing have meaning? And I thought, I wonder if this is why volunteering can be so powerful mm-hmm. for people who are so lost in what doesn't matter, for them to, in sharp relief, be a part of something that has an impact on someone's life. And giving. Yeah. Contributing something of meaning, right? Like volunteering, you said, some people feel like they do it more through giving and um, of the resources that they have. And that's, that's great. But the more you can connect with real life Meaning, as far as what actually keeps people functioning, what actually keeps people alive? Well, getting things up out of the ground keeps someone alive, right? Um, Actually having a relationship with an animal that you may have to put down uh, in order to live, that's that's a pretty real life relationship and it's meaningful. Uh, and so there are there are these decisions that we can make in our life to say, okay, I I realize I'm inundated. If we're we're in this whole first world problem, we call it right. If we're inundated by first world problems, can we take a step back for a moment and say, let's let's get my hands dirty a little bit, actually in the ground. Let's connect with the earth. Let's actually step into a little more physical nature of who I even am because most often these little first world problems start to take us out going back to that separation again of who we really who who we are emotionally spiritually and physically and these little tasks start to begin to run our day and if we get more into our body as opposed to out of it can that help us work with fear? And do you have an example of that? So a patient recently of mine, um, she had to have an abortion. She was in a situation where she needed to, to do that. That's, um, it brought a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Uh, it was a really difficult decision for her and it's not an easy one for anyone to make in any situation regardless Um, but a lot of the work that we've been doing with her is to help her to to acknowledge the, the place that she was and the time that she was there and the decision that she she made based on where she was we have to recognize that things that we do in life, we, we mentioned before, sometimes we, lo- we feel like we lose it or we're watching ourselves from above and we can't believe it, or we regret or have shame over certain decisions that we make, right? Because of emotional outbursts or because we act in a way we think is not necessarily truly us. Um, we, we should not, we should not... Um, take our or hold ourselves so accountable for the decisions that we make that we expect ourselves to have a level of perfection that is higher than anyone that has ever lived. And I think we often get ourselves there where we think, oh man, uh, you know, uh, this shouldn't have happened in my life. Well, why? I like why shouldn't things happen in your life? Things are meant to happen in our life. We're meant to have experiences. They're teaching for us. They're learning. They're growing. So the first thing we have to recognize when we have something that occurs in our life that we might, let's say, regret is, you know, let's take a deep breath. Let's go to that space and let's see if we can bring some peace as opposed to anxiety and stress and fear. Let's see if we can bring some peace into that space and say, okay, I accept me. And maybe even I forgive me for 
you know, where I was. And I love me where I was. And I, I think that a lot of a lot of us get carried away by this this perfectionism. We do it when we judge others. We hold others as well to such a, a high standard we feel like. You let me down. I can't believe you did this. Well, you know, everyone's going to let you down at some point. And we do. We let ourselves down. And that's because we have these expectations, again, that seem to be higher than real life. So what we really need to embrace is we're, we're all going to be let down from time to time. Or we're all going to not meet expectations. And so we work a lot on helping her to just bring peace to that space that she was, to pour love into the situation that she was in, and to bring that love forward with threads of light and love into the current state that she is now. And that's all imagery. It doesn't, and, and that's all it can be because it's in the past. You can't do anything more than imagery with it at this point, right? And yes, there's a physical remnant that she feels. But the best way for you to clear a lot of that as well is with the very visual imagery um, and that, that work of just going through and saying, I'm going to bring love, I'm going to bring in peace into this situation and we do that through a meditation. We do that through acupuncture. We do that through heart math. Mm-hmm. Connecting the heart and mind. Yeah. Heart math is a difficult one to explain until you've until you've actually done it, but it's pretty powerful, and I think it's great. If folks want to learn more about heart math, how would you suggest they do that? Well, you can you can look at. Um, Heart math, you can search heart math online and evaluate that as well. But we have a lot of information here on heart math at our practice. Uh, you can you can call us here or you can have a, uh, a consult with Christy. She she is our therapist that runs our heart math in our office. Can we do that online? Is that something where if they don't live locally, you could? Yeah, we can do we can do either a um, virtual. Um, Face to face, or you can even just do a phone consult question. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about, and she's wonderful. I'm just thinking about fear, and there are certain things that can happen if you sit there in la la land and you're at peace and ah, namaste, everything's fine. Well, if you don't show up for work that day, you yeah. could lose your job, and if you don't pay more attention, you could get a, a crash on the interstate, and if you don't, you know, and it's like my thinking mind just takes over. So what is the dance between what is possible and how we can live with less fear? And I'm guessing. So you're talking about balance. Like really what you're saying is where's that balance, right? And uh, in, in Eastern medicine, again, this, this shen, and this body and the mind or the body and the spirit. But we need a balance between these, like working together in harmony. Right. In in Western medicine, we call it the autonomic nervous system. In Eastern medicine, medicine, when we are in balance, we call it Zen. We have this Zen feeling. Mm. I'm just going to go get in my Zen. P- people love to make fun of that in our culture. Right. They, uh, Sounds pretty good to me. But it is good. Right. It's Zen essentially is this this idea of balance in Western medicine. It's um, autonomic nervous system balance. So the nervous system really is what regulates the autonomic nervous system specifically is what regulates heart rhythms. So if we have a variability or if we have um, a a significant erratic uh, behavior in the heart where all of a sudden we feel it really pumping fast and then it don't don't slow right and we have this erratic heart rate well, that's a sign that our autonomic nervous system is in dysfunction. So heart math works with the autonomic nervous system by giving you biofeedback 
it's like a a, a graph. Uh, you know, it's a visual so that you can see how your autonomic nervous system is functioning, and it shows you that by giving you feedback on your heart rhythm. And so you're sitting there watching your heart rate variability, and if it if you're having strong peaks and and sharp valleys, or if you're rising quickly and slowly, or if you're having a very nice, smooth peak and valley run, then you know, okay, that's what I'm looking for. There's my zen. And so it's a this biofeedback idea of saying, okay, we're going to give you a tool to use that you can look at and see that's monitoring you. And then you'll have an idea of, okay, now I can see where I am. I'm closer to zen, right? And then... You can say, well, now let's bring up some of these, the desensitization idea. Let's bring up some of these fears or triggers that you might have. And then see, while we're talking about these fears or triggers, if you can also regulate that heart. Because you're going to see it on the monitor, right? So, we want to stay in Zen while we're, you know, being exposed to or discussing those triggers, and it's a, it's a practice. It's a practice like meditation. It's a practice like acupuncture. Uh, it's a practice. But you do it with a coach or the therapist. Christy does a fantastic job. And when it comes to fears, again, if, if your fear is the snake, if your fear is the fall, if your fear is getting into another relationship and somebody leaving you, regardless of what your fear is, uh, Christy is incredibly good getting straight to the point, uh, getting right down to, hey, this is this is what, let's just get this out. I think that's kind of a phrase for her. Uh, she'll just say, okay, let's just talk about this right now. Uh, and she just usually will get right to things. I usually fluff around things myself. And so I really, I really like having her in the office because I like to come about things really gradually and and hint eh, not really hint but maybe with examples and little imagery and stories and things and then she goes okay let's just stop doing this right now okay can we do that can we all can we all admit that this is where we are every time i go straight larry david and if you know curb your enthusiasm or the creator of seinfeld i can be very la- larry david and very blunt and one time i went into work with her i was like I can't do this anymore. I'm in a really bad mood, and here's why. And she just appreciated it. I just got right to it. I was like, mm-hmm. I could make more small talk with you, but I'm in a really bad place. I don't feel like being very friendly right now. And then we worked with that. It was great. Yeah. But most people can't handle the truth. Dr. She, Ron. She meets you where you are. All right. One quick tip. Can you give me something that I can take with me in my life today to work with fear? Yeah. The, the number one best thing you can do to work with fear is to face it. What does that mean? <laughs> Okay, what does that mean? So the no, little exposures, so determine whether you're going to do little exposures or a significant one over time, right? So what does it mean if I have a fear of dogs? Go to the pound, right? Or go to the neighbors who has a dog. Or What if it's I, I'm afraid to ask that girl out at the coffee shop or I'm afraid of what will happen if I take this job or make this career risk, or I'm afraid of what will happen if and we're living in a hypothetical idea world as opposed to what's going to happen if I pet a dog. What if they, what if when I go over to do something nice for my neighbor, they are mad and don't like me? Yeah, that's, that is our life's work to continue doing those things that are that for some reason we have these fears, that we create these fears about, I don't know, I'm not very good at communicating. They might think that I'm less than I am. Well, you know what? We all are less than we are. So let's just get that out there right now. Ooh, I like that. Right? We're we're all, let, let's not build ourselves up to be something grander than we are either. Because if, we, if, if our fear is not doing something beneficial or good for our neighbor because you know we're afraid they might think that well our our offering is lesser or something then we have a real problem and what we're trying to do really is hold up an image of ourselves that doesn't exist 
It's not true anyway, right? If if we're if we're afraid to do something because someone might discover something or might say something, uh, well, then I think the real problem is that we're trying to uphold an image that might really not be the image that is real. So let's let's all commit to live in the moment and to allow reality to be what it is. Now, reality doesn't mean that I'm tied to what I was at that moment. Reality, any of us that look at, into reality realize that it's an ever-changing thing. So, if you want to be something different, work on it. If you want to be better at asking girls out, work on it. Go do it. Stumble. You're going. I mean, if I wanted to be a good soccer player, if I wanted to be a good pianist, if I wanted to be good at violin, I don't just like pick it up one day and go. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't do that. And if I did do that on a stage in a performance. I w- that would be an embarrassing moment because I wouldn't be any good at it. And so give yourself a, the space and the time to say, okay, here's I'm going to I'm going to choose to ask these girls out on a more regular basis. I'm going to ask for their number. I'm going to tell girls that I think they're beautiful. Gen- genuinely, when I when I feel that, you know what, you have great eyes, or you know, and and leave it there. You don't have to try to pursue anything more than that, but give yourself the opportunities and the freedom to do that stuff, and you'll find that you'll get better and better and better at it. So whatever your fear is, whatever you're afraid of, create some time for yourself. On a, on a gradual basis, unless you think, hey, I'm just going to go tackle this right now, bam. But I would say recommend on a gradual basis of, okay, I'm going to do this little step, and I'm going to go over here to the coffee shop, and when I see a girl that I think is cute, I'm going to tell her, hey, you know what? That's a cute dress, or you have really nice eyes, or whatever, and, and that's it. But get, allow yourself to get more comfortable with your fears. Should we end there? Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ron Dumar. Nick, the curious patient, um, we want you to reach out to us. Be well now podcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you about what you want us to talk about. What do you like? What do you not like? I'm still afraid of a lot of things, but I'm going to try to face those fears today and work with that and... The work is never done. Yeah, me too. I'm going to face my fears. I face my fears every day. Ron, you have amazing eyes. There you go. Oh, man. I love it. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. How kind was that? It's getting weird in here. Was that over? Do you just feel so much better now, though? I feel so good. Actually, I feel so much weirder now. Is that what you're saying? (laughs) Let's end on the weird vibe. Uh, Thanks, y'all. Appreciate you. Namaste. Namaste. We'll see you on the next one.